Welcome back. In part two, Christian discusses the influential Discordian trilogy of books called Illuminatus. And we make a little sidestep into discussion about how Bill and Ted may or may not fit into the picture as we move throughout the 80s and 90s. We also talk about Discordianism's links to science fiction and fanzines. Christian starts interviewing me at a certain point due to the topic of furries that comes up in our conversation. And then we discuss how Discordianism became a type of cyberculture and how hacking relates to it. Christian shares his ideas about the scholarly side of researching this group and why being in conversation in a spirit of generosity is important for researchers. Okay, so you've you've briefly touched on these uh, these two things about the the motto of Discordian Stick Apart and the Illuminatus. So uh, I was taking a little look at all of your other uh, writings, and in your chapter Discordian Stick Apart in <laughs> fiction, invention, and hyper reality that people can find on academia.edu as well. Thanks for the uh, plug, Stephanie. Really appreciate it. <laughs> very welcome. Uh, you discuss this trilogy called Illuminatus and how this work offered readers, quote, a frame of reference for integrating discordianism into their own lives, end quote. So what was this about, this trilogy? And why was this considered the ultimate mind fuck? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the Illuminati trilogy, it's a series of books published in 1975 by Dell Press, which specialized in science fiction. Uh, the text itself was written in the late 60s, but it just couldn't get published. I mean, it was a thousand pages, endless appendices, nonlinear narrative. Uh, yeah. You've heard of easy listening? Mm -hmm. This is like difficult reading, you know, I mean, very, very much modeled on James Joyce and, and, and Burroughs's uh, Naked Lunch. So it's not the easiest book to digest. So the fact that it took five years to get published is not a surprise. But the authors, Robin Anton Wilson and Robert Shea, intended for it to come out in the hottest part of the 60s era, you know, the, the, when things were really heating up after the Democratic Convention in 1968, um, as the flower power was turning into freak power, as pacifism was giving way to street violence, they really intended for this book to come out to level out the heads, to, to really remind the heads of the ideals that animated the early hipsters, the early hip scene. But it was delayed till 75. So it had a very different reception history. In many ways, the book felt almost cringy by virtue of how it was still totally soaked in hip, hip psychedelic ideals, hippie ideals when it came out in 75. But regardless of that, those who did invest in the novel uh, were rewarded with a very rich mythoscape which included the recent past, so it was a historical account, that had been rewritten in the uh, language of Discordianism. You know, so all of the familiar figures from the 60s were there, Abby Hoffman, Tim Leary, Bucky Fuller, the Yippies. But instead of the history that we would have read in the paper, or even the underground press, uh, the history was inserted into a longer conflict between the Discordians and the Illuminati that reaches all the way back to Atlantis. And so on one level, it's a very funny yarn. It's a fantastic satirical story about the recent past and the excesses and, and, and the ideals and the virtues that psychedelicists were attempting to substantiate. But more than that, it was an exercise in mind fucking because um, it really did illustrate the way in which even the most hard and fast empirical narratives were not to be trusted that behind every aspect of the recent past, um, there was, there was a modicum of suspicion that would open up different possibilities for how things could have turned out. So I think that a good sort of, if I was going to compare the book to something, I would say Ishmael reads mumbo jumbo, which I think is quoted in the book, uh, which was published some years before, but this is a retelling of history 
to entertain, but also to indicate the possibilities that exist in the interstices. You know, what if we interpret this scenario differently? What if we exaggerate the villainy on this side and the heroics of this side? How does that let us view history different? So I like to think of it, I think other people have mentioned that Illuminatus is fiction as theory. And really, I think we were earlier off off air, we were talking about hyperstition. Mm -hmm. You could read it as a hyperstitional document insofar as it's a fiction. Yeah with real people Mm -hmm. about a real group that exists and group that you could join. You could become a Discordian. It included the Discordian membership card, which they encourage you to cut out of the novel and to carry with you. And it also blended fictional elements such as, well, fiction to perhaps certain people, maybe certain people think it's real, but the whole narrative uh, around Atlantis and, and all of that. Yeah, and I have to say, it's one of these books I like to think of as stoned literature, like (laughs) books that the authors intended the readers to dig into while stoned. And so there's all these moments that you're like, oh my God, this is such pothead humor. It's really quite amusing. Like at one point, the characters are like, oh wait, they get stoned and they're like, I just realized we're characters in a novel. You know, very late night dorm room samadhi. So is this like Bill and Ted going on their excellent adventure? Um, a little bit more intellectual than Bill and Ted. I think Bill and Ted uh, reflect a very 90s drug war stereotype of mm-hmm. the stoner. Because, you know, if you look at, uh, I think each decade has its stereotype of the stoner. Mm-hmm. And as the drug war became uh, more violent and a larger bureaucratic entity, I, I think that the depiction of the drug user became uh, more idiotic, yeah. less interesting, less productive, and less funny. And I think Bill and Ted was a satire, I think a pretty keen satire, a pretty funny satire, on the drug war cartoonish stereotype of the stoner. So in that sense, I think it was working in the idiom mm-hmm. of satire, and in that way, I think it's a success. But no, I, I think that the, the characters that appeal as stoners in Illuminati are uh, pretty impressive intellectuals that, okay. that know their Kabbalah. Mm-hmm. They know their astrology. They, they're, you know, a few of them are electrical engineers, <laughs> you know, like they, they know uh, the glorious tradition of anarchism and, and the finer points of wobbly ideology over and against Kropotkinism. I mean, they're intellectuals, they're, they're underground intellectuals. And I think yeah. that that is totally effaced in the eighties and nineties depiction of mm. the head of the stoner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This doesn't sound like a, kind of a, a vapid or <laughs> not, no, no, I'm not dissing Bill and Ted. I like Bill and Ted, but <laughs> I mean, they're, yeah, they're not really the smartest, uh, no, <laughs> the smartest. No, they're buffoons. I, I think they, they, they very much embody this really, I think, glorious tradition of buffoonery. Yeah. But in that sense of being satire, I thought mm, maybe that has uh, some elements that people could kind of relate to. That, but you're what you're talking about. These characters and Illuminati seem to be much more uh, educated as to different areas of thought, esoteric, uh, yeah. scientific. Well, uh, well I think that you know, Bill is had interesting. Stephanie, I love that uh, idea. That's really cool. I'm thinking about it now for the first time. But they are a commentary. The sort of know nothing doofuses, yeah, doofus, uh, represent, yeah. yeah, represent a clear indication of what happens when a culture is cut off from its roots. Mm. So because the drug war was pursued with such ferocity, such draconian measures in the United States, that you had people who continued with these social practices. Maybe Bill and Ted, I could see them at a fish concert. You know, I could, mm-hmm. I could see them participating. I could see them surfing. I could see them participating in many of the social rituals that, that were really engineered by psychedelicists in the 60s and 70s. However, because all of the older members of that tradition had been imprisoned or murdered, they have no connection to it. So they are stumbling goofballs, uh, you know, who, who who I think ultimately are quite lovable. I haven't seen Bill and Ted in 20 years, but yeah, it's from a what long I, remember, time. Yeah. I, I do think they have a pure heart. And, no, and they so, do. They do. But they right. do seem a little you, lost. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, they're, that's a statement on what happens. Yeah, yeah. When they have, when um, you know, underground newspapers are not collected in libraries. When uh, the works of the psychedelic church movement, I'm, I'm thinking of Carista or uh, the, the, the Merry Pranksters or Ed Sanders Fugs, or you know, all of this rich culture, um, the only access they have to it is to the commercialized mm. artifacts of 
Right. Which, of course, would be thought would be lame as hell. I mean, that's what my grandparents did. That's what my parents did. What do I want with that? So they only have access to the commercial elements of this culture. And I, I, I don't think that that would be uh, very relevant to their experience uh, and, uh, as opposed to uh, the writings of Discordianism or, or, or the writings of uh, Up Against the Wall Motherfuckers or the Werewolf Brigade or some of these psychedelic militants who would speak directly to the suspicion and disinterest that Bill and Ted both have yeah. to productive uh, corporate America or even, I mean, their approach to the Protestant work ethic, which as far as I remember was a total rejection, totally within keeping of hip militants. Totally. Well, let's, let's talk about this a little bit more about their communications and how they communicated with each other. Cause we kind of uh, skipped over that. That was a pretty important aspect of their, um, of, of, of their sharing of ideas was, was the whole uh, zines, right? Yeah. Well, well, zines really came about in the, or was that later? Well, yeah, well, I mean, zines have been around since the 30s. Science fiction fans had used them. Uh, horror, horror, you know, gothic horror writers have been using them. Uh, they, they were called APAs. It's, so put it like this. Americans have been ranting in type from the getty up. Right? You can, I mean, you go all the way back to Thomas Paine. You know what I mean? In common sense. Like, Americans be ranting. You know, they, they're just going off. So you're not going to stop them. But where the tradition of fanzines intersects with psychedelic psychedelicist militants that that would be the the early 80s the late 70s early 80s. but before that of course you had the underground press the underground press was such a phenomenon and before that you had the beat beatnik chap books these like hand bound mimeo sheets mm-hmm. you would hand out with your poetry on them i mean yeah they're, they're, and there's some really great collections of um the mimeo poetry handed out by for example at the red door in in, in detroit by uh, lenny st Clair. John Sinclair would later be involved in that. And then, yeah, if you look on the West Coast, of course, you and the East Coast, you have like Dancing Bear. You have Big Table out of Chicago. You have, because of course, let's not forget that America had incredibly strict censorship laws that in fact uh, were contested, of course, by Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer, but really didn't get overturned um, until you had a series of really high profile trials, first centered on Naked Lunch and then Howl. I mean, imagine that. Ginsburg wrote Howl, 56, I think. Uh, tried to publish it, and the 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 um, police raided city lights, confiscating copies. And it wouldn't be till a number of years later that he could actually perform that, uh, for fear of getting uh, assaulted by police officers. And that was one way in which the police were able to limit the influence of. Uh, some of these psychedelicists. Uh, for example, our Crumb, our Crumb comics. We think, oh, doesn't doesn't even really phase people today. Uh, those were. Um, some is that those were prohibited documents by virtue of violating obscenity laws. And so a lot of um, newspaper sellers and comic book printers, underground printers were raided and essentially put out of business. Um, not of course, because of, uh, you know, these archaic laws, but because they, the, the government didn't like what they were saying. So all of this is to say that the history of psychedelicist communication, the history of hip communication, the history, of, the material culture of hip, let's call it that. Mm-hmm. Fascinating because it certainly doesn't map on to corporate media at all. Right. And in fact, often it had to find ways to circumvent the corporate media. Um, and so, yeah, it begins with chapbooks, really underground press until the 60s. And then in the 70s, you have the death of the underground press, totally stamped out by the U.S. government and, you know, a waning of enthusiasm by virtue of the end of the Vietnam War in the mid-70s. Anyways, major sea changes, and then you have, uh, and really the fanzine, the explosion of fanzines, you know, because as I said, fanzines have been around for a very long time. Science fiction fans have been using them, I think, with the greatest enthusiasm since the 30s. Mm-hmm. Uh, punk rock certainly had a really robust fan culture. Uh, and that, of course, of course, you know, you're not going to find these bands played uh, or promoted on the radio. No. No, no, or no. the television. I mean, come on. You can't even say their names. Right. <laughs> There's no way Dick <laughs> Clark is, you know, going to talk about, uh, you know, sex pistols. Or, right. Not going to be on American Bandstand. No. So how do you get word? Well, you know, someone has a Mimeo machine and they crank out a handbill that's like next week at the Whiskey Go-Go. You know, come see the New York Dolls. The week after that, mm-hmm, come see mm-hmm. my friends playing this squat, you know, whatever. So after the uh, publication then 
of Illuminatus as a science fiction novel, then they started using the fanzine, the science fi- science fiction fanzine, as a also as a mode of communication. Well, you know, science fiction had such purchase among psychedelicists in the fifties okay. and sixties and seventies. Um, so you know, let's not forget Jack thing. Kerouac. Yeah, yeah, Jack Kerouac wrote a science fiction novel, right. Doctor Sex. You know, that's often forgotten because he's now like this monument of literature, right, but right. You know, pulp, you know, mm-hmm. like Lovecraft and all that. But anyways, um, yeah, Robert Anton Wilson was very much a science fiction reader, as many of his ilk were. And when Dell came out and said, yeah, we'll publish this monster of a book. But of course, it's it's trash. You know, it's <laughs> it's, it's raunchy sex. It's exploitative violence. There's only one genre for you, my friend. And that's the bargain basement trash strata of unserious literature we know as science fiction. Of course, science fiction has been uh, marginalized unfairly forever Mm -hmm. you know still is anyways uh, it it was uh it turned out to be quite a boon because because it is marginalized science fiction fans who who at that point were much more organized than any other fandom in american culture that that's a bold claim maybe that's not true but um science fiction fans were incredibly organized with their own conferences with their own publications um with their own presses anyways once Luminous was published within the science fiction realm. Science fiction's fans glommed onto it. Here I'm thinking of Arthur Halavity, who, a, a, a key figure in 1970s fandom, uh, read it and was like, you know, all that sex, drugs, and magic and anarchism really is appealing. Uh, and he starts producing his own fanzine, and his fanzine attracts more science fiction fans. So science fiction fans really became the backbone, really, be, really carried the torch for psychedelic militancy. In a time where the war on drugs was heating up, in a time where paranoia was rife, and a lot of these scenes were breaking down, science fiction fans represent, in my argument, you know, in, in, in my book, The Angel Headed Hipsters, I really shine a light on them and lift them up and saying, you know, science fiction fans really did carry the torch in this really important period of the mid 70s to the 80s. And then we have, of course, the second wave of psychedelic enthusiasm in the 80s. And of course, you know, people think, what? Second, second wave? In fact, psychedelicism, the second wave in the 80s was even bigger than the first wave. But the fact that it never registered, you know, it's not hard to parse out. By that time, psychedelic culture had integrated itself into American society. You know, the Grateful Dead had been touring right. for 20 years. Yeah, yeah. You know, any other weekend, you could go to a music festival. You know, uh, insurance executives were tripping on acid and going to Esalen. Like, mm-hmm. the psychedelic thing had succeeded. You know, computers were on the horizon. So th- that's why it didn't make as big of a splash because the structure was in place. So the elaboration of that structure and the diversification of the people involved in psychedelicism didn't register as a seismic shift, uh, particularly because the war on drugs was on and you really couldn't be so public with that. So, and that's another reason that fanzines became so popular is because it was a way to circumvent the war on drugs and, and, and political reprisals. Very, very interesting. I'm looking down at my notes here, and I'm looking at um, a quote, your quote, uh, that the oh, tri- the trilogy, it's also <laughs> taken from uh, Discordian Stick Apart, uh, by the way. Uh, the quote is, the trilogy acted as a gateway through which science fiction readers were led to conceptualize Discordianism as an intellectual platform for attaining higher states of consciousness through anarchism, magic, and psychedelics. So, I, I don't know. Is is magic like a new thing that's been added to this? Because I didn't hear you talking about magic before when the Discordians first got together. So, was this kind of an added uh, dimension to this attaining higher states of consciousness by using magic? Well, yeah, you know... Uh, and, and by magic, I, I think we should specify that there's a K at the end there, which would indicate yes, with a K. Uh, Alistair Crowley's mm-hmm. particular ideas, and the ideas of his followers. Um, well, you know, Alistair Crowley was very much in vogue amongst certain hip subcultures, for yes. certain psychedelicists, particularly in Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, he was very hip and in certain parts of uh, the East Village. And, and you know, w- when you perused the psychedelic psychedelicist bookstore, you know, you had your underground press, you had your Dover reprints of Lovecraft, and you might have, you know, 
uh, Arthur Wade, you, you know, you'd have some of this uh, a culture circulating mm-hmm. alongside Leary, this sort of thing. So, you know, Cr- Crowley was always in the mix. However, as psychedelicist, the psychedelicist movement um, really waned in the early 70s, you had Illuminatus come out in 75. And because it was written in 68, it still presented all of this a culture of the late 60s yeah. as new and exciting as hip and it's where it's at. So science fiction fans who perhaps weren't as invested in those, uh, in those, uh, in that milieu. Mm-hmm. Well, now in the mid seventies, discordianism is presented as a belief system, as a platform to understand the world, right? You don't understand mm-hmm. it unless you laugh and you know, unless yeah. you cry, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Well, that is, let's say that's the operating system. And then the software that you put into that operating system is anarchism and magic and psychedelics because that's what the characters in Illuminati, in Illuminatus, were involved with. So, you know, readers would say, oh, you know, I really like this hip stuff. I really like this psychedelic stuff. So they would say, oh, you know, maybe I'm a discordian because I am using drugs for the alteration of consciousness. I'm very much participating in this subculture. And what are the things that those characters in Illuminatus like? Oh, they like magic. Well, maybe I should go look at that. And understand it in the way that the Discordians understand it. Well, let me go look at anarchism. Maybe I should understand that in the way that the Discordians understand it and, and psychedelics. So Discordianism gave them a way to understand these, what can I say, rejected knowledges, mm-hmm. you know, these taboo subjects. Yeah, so it yeah. wasn't just, I'm sorry, yeah? No, I was just agreeing with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it gave them a way to appreciate these otherwise distinct and free-floating sets of knowledge and and i should also say just one i would be remiss if i didn't i know i'm going on like chattering here but uh, i should just indicate just how unpopular it was to be a science fiction nerd in the 70s today i think it's common for people oh i'm such a nerd i watch star wars on the disney channel you know being a nerd in the 70s was absolute hell like it was not cool or fashionable or anything like that it was total rejection you're never gonna get a date you know you're never gonna fit in it was absolute nonconformity, and so that's why science fiction fandom was really a hothouse by virtue of being outside of culture and in many ways uh, something that you would not freely admit it allowed for the people invested in that milieu to really make something special of it and to really cultivate a sense of togetherness and friendship and innovation i mean so many things that are popular today cosplay mm. for example or, or even the furry subculture if you've ever heard yeah. of that yeah uh, yes i have heard fanzine of that. yeah fan conventions like comic-con all that stuff comics you know uh, space opera all that stuff was generated out of this hothouse of 1970s science fiction fandom it's very interesting and very important as well that you make that distinction because nowadays it's there is this kind of a sentiment that being a nerd is cool being the science fiction nerd is a, is a good thing in a way, you know, you can be, you can wear that as a badge and be proud of it. You know, I'm a, I'm a sci-fi nerd, you know, type of thing, but that's a different way of looking at it now than, uh, than what it was back then. So. So it begs the question, what now occupies that marginality? Is it, you know, the, the sports enthusiasts who are like, you know, tanned and handsome and whatever. I mean, is it the Barbies and Kens that are now, you know, the, I don't know. I doubt it. No, there's probably another subculture now that is rejected and uh, totally um, prohibited from participating in mainstream society that. um, Well, I, I might put forth that, the research that I've done into other kin and tulpas, uh, tulpamancy, that because uh, you mentioned furries and furries are kind of a, um, I would say like a cosplay aspect of people who I who want to identify with a anthropomorphic uh, animal human type character. Um, those people are considered. I would say those people would be considered the the new outcast. I guess you could say furries, bronies, those types of um, those types of uh, groups. Uh, but they get they get uh, kind of associated with other kin and 
the Tulpomancy community in that there's this taboo to it. The, the furries and the bronies, to, to my understanding, there's this sexual aspect of it. And that's the taboo aspect. And they want to dress up like the anthropomorphic animal that they that they relate to. But that's a very different thing than other kin. And other kin are people who identify as other than human, right. ontologically other than human. It's not just a fandom yeah. thing. But yeah. this this whole aspect of uh, identity and identifying as something other than uh, the human, um, I think that is kind of the new taboo. People don't like to talk inclusively about that. They get mm -hmm. a lot of, and it's this is all online culture now that I'm talking about, uh, mostly online. And yeah, those people are pretty ostracized, I would say. And, and I think, therefore, and, and, and Stephanie, that's so right on. The more you're telling me about it, the more I'm thinking about it. And this is why it's so fun to talk to you. But I feel like we're thinking together here because I, I really think you're onto something. And um, underlying Angel Headed Hipsters, this book I have coming out, um, Okay, I, I'm a historian and I like to talk about people, places, and things. But of course, because it's a scholarly book, it has to have an apparatus. You know, you got to have the engine. What's the scholarly methodology? And, and yeah. my methodology is what I call the dialectic of hip, which is you have a creative efflorescence of ideas and new ways of doing things and fashion and, 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 and language and art. And, okay. And then it rejects the status quo or, or proposes an alternative to the status quo to innovate something. And then the thing it was rejecting absorbs it. So it has the thesis and then you have the antithesis. This is like crude dialectics. Antithesis, whereas now rock music was uh, very uh, looked at as discordant and antisocial, is now the new yeah. normal. Yeah. yeah it's called, right now we live in what's called the tyranny of hip. Or the conquest of cool. You have to be cool, you know. Anyways, um, and I, this is how I chart the rise and fall of psychedelicist militants. You know, that if you talk to beat poets from the 50s, they'll tell you that they were hated on, spat on. Uh, physically assaulted on the street by college students because they were looked at as long hair. You know, let's not forget Beat Nick was uh, coined after Spud Nick as communist, as, as subversive, mm. as somehow dangerous to the social body. And um, moving forward, you, you, you see an absorption, a massification of that ethic, um, at, which only then sets off a counter ethic, right? It sets off a, an alternative ethic and an innovative ethic. So it goes round and round as creativity happens, mass culture absorbs it, which then ushers in a new wave of creativity. And it, it yeah, I, I see how the, the, brony um, furry cosplay spectrum if i can put it like that mm -hmm. participates in that and because you know so where where would bronies and 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 this particular subculture be marginalized within online communities they would be looked at as deviant yeah and also i think although this is not really my area uh with the furries because they're not really a part of the other kin community they're they're kind of seen as being something different uh, because it is more fandom based but i would think that even in within within the uh cosplay uh culture that you know you have a lot of the the cons where you could go to all these different uh comic-con and all these different you know conventions um i would imagine uh, this would just be a guess on my part. I'm not certain, but I would imagine that that's kind of where this would play out if it was in a physical place. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I would think that it'd be at least what I've seen so far of the, the negative uh, way of, of speaking about it is, is online because most of my yeah. research has been online. So I see, and you know, it just, it raises so many questions. I know this isn't a podcast about, about furries and I know that we can't get, <laughs> but I just want to ask one more thing. I mean, it's, it's so fascinating because I would really like to know the difference between, uh, and, and what's really impressive about this culture is a lot of it's handmade. A lot of it is folk craft that yeah. they put their, they work all week and put their hard earned money mm -hmm. into these beautiful ornate vestments or garbs or costumes. I'm not sure of what they would like it to be called, but from an outsider perspective, I can only admire 
Um, and, and, but I'd like to know the difference between someone who has a dream or, or maybe has a ecstatic experience of, of seeing themselves as a, uh, a different uh, uh, being. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they see themselves as a different being. And then they go and create that being out from the things they bought at the craft store and those who make uh, the tiger from Captain Crunch. You know, like mm-hmm. there are people who want to make costumes of established characters and those people who see themselves as another being and make that being into reality. I imagine that that would be a two different groups within the furry fandom. And then underneath that, you would have those who probably are in it just for kicks, for sexual yeah, kicks. I, I think there are, there are layers uh, to this group. Uh, what they what the term that I've heard used is fursona. Like for Sona. Yeah. Sona. <laughs> so creative, Instead like everything here. Yeah. It's so yeah. cool. It's so creative. interesting. Uh, but yeah, I wouldn't say that all furries are in it because of their uh, because of the sexual aspect. I would not. I, I would not go far to so, of course so not. far to yeah, say that. But that for some people, the sexual aspect is right. a part of it. Of course. Um, yeah. But yeah, the that this is um this is like an uh, identification with this anthropomorphic uh, character. And what you what you say is very true. They they make their own costumes, and this is. But this is, I don't know if you could say. I well, I wouldn't say it's just a hobby. I think that there's something deeper going on here, uh, because this is a very very serious part of of their life lives. Uh, but yeah, this desire to identify with something other than your own. Um, ontology, I guess you could say, <laughs> you know, this, this yeah. desire to yeah. identify as something else. Um, that is something that I've, that with, within my own research that I see this, this change happening or this, that it has happened over decennia, I guess it's, uh, um, it's, it's not just a recent thing. It's been happening. It, it's been happening for longer than you would think. Uh, but because of the internet, it seems like the, the internet cyberspace has, has created a platform for this expression so that more people right. are knowing about it. Well, yeah, I, I should say, and, and here we go. Perfect segue. Thanks for the alley-oop. Uh, <laughs> Stephanie, uh, you know, my, my expertise is, is on psychedelic culture and, and my real focus is on fanzines. It's, it's on this explosion of self-made publications in the 1980s. And I'm constantly trying to find new archives to search through, which is really nice because I remember when I started my PhD, while I was attracted to material, I was much more attracted to the human relationships that would be created out of searching this material. And a lot of these people are alive. They're, they're elderly and I thought, well, this is a fantastic opportunity for me to be having discussions across generations to people uh, who are participating in hip culture or the periphery of hip culture. Um, and so that's what really got me excited about my PhD dissertation on fanzines, which is, wow, I get to really explore an undiscovered continent of primary source material that, yeah. and this is the dream, everyone thinks is unworthy of study. Oh, my God, <laughs> I, you can't get any better than that. Studying something that no one thinks is important. Woo, that's really exciting. Yeah. And um, of course, I, I have a pretty big fanzine collection myself. I used to make fanzines for many years. And over the course of collecting and trading, I got a stack of what you could call furry fanzines from the 70s. And so as far as my research has indicated, yeah. this is another product of science fiction fandom in the 70s, which again, total black hole. Not many people have looked at it other than science fiction fans. So science fiction fandom intellectual culture is so dense they have everything period i mean they have reviews of reviews of reviews i mean it's really quite dense stuff so studying it was really great and i should i should say here that if it wasn't for jay kenny uh one of the people i met over the course of my research i wouldn't have been able to make heads or tails of it you know so jay kenny really and this is of course he's a major figure this is the guy who put out the publisher of gnosis magazine the glossy magazine on western esotericism in in the 90s in the 80s and 90s he was also, of course, a participant in, uh, he was one of the underground cartoonists alongside Spain Rodriguez and Art Crumb. So I always claim that this guy had like a sixth sense for what was hip. I mean, he was an underground cartoonist. Uh, and then in the 70s was um, very much starting to drift into science fiction fandom, became a member of science fiction fandom, started producing science fiction fanzines in the 70s, you know, alongside the Discordian people. 
in the 80s was on the ground floor of the Church of the Subgenius, one of the original members. And then the 90s was producing Gnosis. I mean, talk about a sick sense. The guy's really quite, I, yeah, there's really, it's hard to explain how his knack. But anyways, um, I, I look at fanzines and and through exploring this realm, not only did I recognize that, wow, furries were part of science fiction fandom. That's interesting. But all of this other underculture, I guess you could call it, or unofficial culture, uh, really illustrated to me that historians have are, are still in the dark about what happened in the 1980s. Forget the 1990s. The 90s are a black hole, man. <laughs> Nobody knows what happens in the 90s. And I think as, because, you know, uh, scholarship on the, the beatnik is, ve- that's shelves and shelves and shelves. Many, many books on the beat generation and even individual figures. Moving to the 60s, we have many, many shelves on the 1960s. Not just memoirs, but academic accounts. You know, we have Timothy Miller's fantastic book, The Hippies. That's really good. We have Christopher Partridge's High Culture, which has a thick section on the 60s thing. Okay, now moving away from the 60s, we look at the 70s. Eh, the literature gets a lot more thin. I think the only solid text we have on psychedelic culture in the 1970s is Eric Davis's High Weirdness. That is the landmark for scholars now beginning to uncover and disassemble this narrative of 60s exceptionalism. This, this idea, this chronotrope of the 60s need to be, needs to be dismantled. Because it's not just not accurate. You know, like psychedelicism was like poof, like Cinderella. It turned into a pumpkin. <laughs> as soon as the clock turned over, forget it. No way. It's not true. Right, right. And, and Davis, I think, has done such a fantastic job of illustrating the way in which psychedelic <clears throat> culture dispersed and, in fact, diversified in the 70s. My book on the 80s. That, that, that is a voice in the wilderness. I mean, there's just so little there. The 90s, you know, come and get it, people. I mean, the 90s, is it's open. I mean, and that was the, that I'm, I remember the 90s. I was there. <laughs> that was the decade of conspiracy. Yeah. You know, that was the X-Files decade. Yes. That, that was the UFO mania decade. So I'm really, of course, there's that fantastic book, A Culture of Conspiracy by Barkun about, that really gets into some of this conspiracy culture. But I'm waiting for, Scholars of esotericism digging. Actually, Stephanie, you would know. You're on the front line. Uh, are any? Is this a Western esotericism podcast or is this a spirituality? This is podcast? a Western esotericism podcast. I would say. It is. Okay. Yeah. Have you met people doing '90s culture? Uh, not not that I can think off the top of my head. No, it's. I mean, I think I'm with you know. You were talking about the the areas of research that nobody deems important. Well, that's kind of what my, my area of research <laughs> within academia is kind of deemed a bit unimportant, but okay. I find it to be incredibly, uh, I find it to be important. And I find that now that I'm talking to you about all these links with sci-fi and fanzines. And I mean, I, I know my own, in my own research that, that there have been, I, I wouldn't call them fanzines, but there were, printed materials that other kin would use in the, you know, in the, in the 70s that they would share with each other. Uh, this was kind of all of an underground type of thing. This was not something you didn't go around telling people that you identified not. as non-human. That means, yeah. you know, that you're just asking for trouble. So this was all, yeah, it's all kind of in that same idea of being the underground, very different ideas, very challenging ideas that people were just not ready for. And this was happening. This, you know, the, the research that I've done so far is, you know, reaching back into the late '60s, early '70s. But I wouldn't be surprised if it goes even further than that. Oh, I insist that it does. I mean, really, really, that that that's the fun yeah. is discovering something that's <laughs> so outside yeah. of your realm, yeah. and saying, "Wow, this seems so new." And then really forcing yourself to realize that there's nothing new under the sun, that yeah, yeah. human culture is human culture. And, you know, and so I'm covering, so there's a lot of really great research on the counterculture culture before the 1960s. So uh, the arguments that, oh, the counterculture culture began in Ascona, Switzerland in the twenties, you know, oh no, no, no. It began in the 1860s. <laughs> you know, yeah. oh no, no, no. It began, you know, and, and bringing it back and back and back. And I think that those are such productive and fun conversations to have oh definitely Uh, the ideas about identifying other as other than human uh that goes back to prehistoric times i would imagine i mean i I can't imagine i cannot imagine i mean the research that i've done so far not so much shamanism but 
because that's a little bit of a different area. Um, sometimes that gets brought into the discussion, but it's not shamanism. You'd have to read my my thesis about it because I do go into a little I'm bit in. of the history yeah. about how far back this does go. I mean, um, it's it's oh, not it's not a modern a modern. Oh, idea. it couldn't be. No. Can I ask one specific technical, technical sure. question here? Sure. Is it taboo? to ask someone about their fursona if they haven't shared it with you already? Because I, I could see that as being um, a bit invasive yeah. to insist upon someone accounting. So is that your experience? J- just for my own edification. Yes. It's uh, as an outsider. No, you do not come in and just start asking questions like that. that of is, course, you yeah, have to yeah. kind of build a rapport uh, with people yeah. before you can start asking personal questions, unless they yeah. offer it themselves to say, you know, my persona yeah. is this. Uh, yeah. No, you don't go just barging in and <laughs> demanding that your answer, your questions be answered. You know, right. it's, it's not like that. It's very, it's very delicate and you have to be very respectful of the people that you're, that you're conversing with. I mean, this it's kind of this weird um, idea that, you know, historians of, of antiquity, they they have books to refer to and they don't really have to worry about, you know, people's yeah. feelings and and, you know, the, the the delicacies of trying to talk to somebody about how they feel about something or what they think about something. And that with this with this type of research that I'm doing, it's it is at the forefront of my mind all of the time. You cannot just go in and barge in and say, oh, I'm researching absolutely. your group. Oh, now you're going to answer my questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You well, I mean, don't do that. Yeah. If, if, if anything, <laughs> I think you have to hold yourself to a higher ideal when it comes yeah. to respect. Ethically, <laughs> it's just not, you just can't do that. a question about other researchers that are studying things in the 90s i mean i just kind of went uh, blank there when you asked me that but i i would say robert is uh robert cabrales is is researching um more of the with the, with the hyperstition and the ccru and 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 all of those links i mean i i think ccru that was in the 90s wasn't it wasn't that a I think so uh yeah 97 i think that that really wonderful ccru book that green one i yeah. think it's just called yeah. ccru writings i yeah. think it's 97 to yeah that's yeah three yes yeah, so that, that would certainly be so this whole this whole concept of the the rhizome and and <laughs> you know multiple realities and and, and things like that I, I yeah i would say that would be my first go to after <laughs> After thinking about it, after my <laughs> mental play. Well, that's the way. It, yeah, Stephanie, that's the way it always is, right? Someone asks you a question that you damn well know the answer, and of course, it's like you know your brain's like nothing. <laughs> you know, nothing. It's just like, <laughs> of course, it doesn't give you what you want. But you know that that does tie into um, cyber culture. That you know, definitely, it's the water we swim in these days. Yeah, and so to write about a time before the internet is particularly exciting, at least for me, because I remember it. I, you know, I got my first cell phone when I was 16. So Mm -hmm. in many ways I have a very, uh, you know, I can, I can really remember what it was like Mm -hmm. to feel isolated with respect to certain subcultures. And then by virtue of that isolation, really having a deep hunger and passion to, communicate with other people who shared particular fascinations. I mean, for me, it was Godzilla fandom and so, and, and mm. giant monster films. And so, uh, you know, by virtue of writing away to one or two of these fanzines, you got a few in return. And then from those fanzines, you know, someone could pass you along to, for example, Ultraman fandom or, you know, and you could start to move laterally in what uh, Colin Campbell calls the cultic milieu yes. or, or what Christopher Partridge calls a culture. Right. And then once you start dabbling in giant monster films, you suddenly get into samurai fiction, 
from samurai fiction, you get into anime and manga. And, you know, th- that was just my own experience. And, and then getting over into cyberpunk and, you know, because the major corporate bookstores were not selling uh, the books I wanted to read. Yeah. Um, th- that only lit a fire, all the br- that, sh- that burned all the hotter uh, to, to make your own, you know, is there anybody out there? That sort of thing. And so, um, yeah, that, that, and, and then, so, you know, I always had this idea that a lot of times in the humanities, if you look at a scholar and you read their PhD thesis, it's like, it's like self archeology. span It's like, why did they do it on that? Of all the things in the world, of course we can all say, Oh, it's just something that needs to be done. No, 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 no. I think that there's some autobiography. What is it? There's a line somewhere in Nietzsche that says all philosophy is autobiography. Mm. You know, there's some affect crystallized there. And, you know, I'm pretty open with mine. In the 1980s, this is, I wanted to know about the culture that I participated in as a young man. And so, you know, looking at the 1980s, I was able to do that. And of course, uh, it wasn't until the end of my, 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 my dissertation that I looked into early 1990s stuff and cyber culture and the way in which fanzine the people who contributed to fanzines recognized the internet, internet 1.0. So I'm talking BBS, I'm talking mm-hmm. message boards. They recognized that as the culmination of the structures that they had already built in the epistolary, in the mail. So fanzine militants uh, and particularly discordians, discordians played a huge role in the rise of the fanzine subculture. I should say that science fiction had fanzines, punk had fanzines, uh, you know, hardcore uh, skinhead, uh, you know, UFOs had fan. everybody had fanzines, but they didn't communicate cross culturally. And it wasn't until the rise of the subgenius church, they produced their own fanzines and their, basically their motto was, you know, come all ye mutants, you know, band together. Mm. Uh, and, and, and so a lot of the, of a lot of these occultural groups, as well as, the psychedelic mil- the psychedelic militants that had been driven into exile by virtue of the war on drugs. You know, they, they had to retreat to their own tiny little groupsicles for fear of persecution. Church of Subgenius said, come, come together. This is a big tent. And so you had them organizing under the auspices of the church. And what I mean by that, of course, is not going and being together. They would write letters and communicate through the church's official organ, which is called the Stark Fist of Removal. And as I argue that the most important important part of the Stark Fist of Removal was not the articles, was not the comics, was not any of that. It was the letter exchange page. It was the classifieds. Anybody else want to talk about mind control, intergalactic orbit laser, you know? Right. And it was under the auspice of the Church of Subgenius that you had an in-gathering of all of these cultural networks under the auspices of the church. And then for certain reasons, one member of the church who was a Discordian, his name was, um, well, actually he was a science fiction fandom fanatic and Discordian. So he was in science fiction, got into Discordianism, Church of Subgenius came, and then uh, he decided to make his own fanzine. And that would be uh, Mike Gunderloy of Fact Sheet 5. And Fact Sheet 5 is looked at as the central fanzine of the fanzine subculture because the fanzine didn't have articles in it. It was only listings and reviews of zines. Hundreds of pages where this one guy would review your shitty little fanzine out of Peoria. You know, you know, my shitty little Godzilla fanzine out of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. You know, he would review all of them. He was a fanatic and he was a Discordian. And so not only would he include all the Discordian iconography and the subgenius iconography in his clearinghouse for the zine scene, but he would review, and he was a very generous person. So it was really hard to find a bad review in Fact Sheet 5. Mm-hmm. He would review hundreds of fanzines. And he did this, you know, from like 81 to like 94. He was really quite dedicated, really a Herculean feat. Anyways, he presented the ingathering of mutants that began in the subgenius church and then sort of detached themselves in the language of discordianism and, and hip and psychedelicist militancy. And so that's the way in which the fanzine culture uh, was really colored with this sacred sense of laughter or operation mindfuck or all of these ideas that we've been talking about. That's how these things were perpetuated into the eighties. And then when cyberspace was invented, um, of course, all of these terms were first coined in fanzines cyberspace itself. This idea that we know from William Gibson's neuromancer first appeared in Bruce Sterling's fanzine 
cheap truth. So when you're looking at subcultural formations in the 80s and 90s, I'm of the impression that is it outsider? Is it underground? Well, don't start talking to me about mainstream published books. I want to know about the fanzines where this stuff was cultivated. And so cyberpunk, cyberculture was brewing in fanzines. And then this is why a lot of the early pioneers of cyberculture were Discordians. Because they believe that, the, that, that fanzines has given rise. You know, you've heard of Son of Godzilla. Well, Son of Fanzine <laughs> was cyberspace. And that's why Cyberspace 1.0 was called Cyberspace. And of course, let's keep in mind, it wasn't the boring collection of pages that the internet is now. It was VR. Early Cyberspace was a place you went. If you remember this line, drop the meat. It was this idea that you would be able to swoop, mm. whoop, right into the internet. And that's where you would have a body of light. Or whatever. And so right. there's this rumor that the first virus, the first computer virus, was a, dis, of a, was a, subjo, a su, subgenius Discordian hoax. Now, I don't think that that is true. I think there were viruses before that. However, the myth itself is important because it indicates the way in which early cyber culture was lousy <laughs> with Discordians and subgenie. So you, you oh, this is interesting because does this? Play... I thought you were gonna say this is tiring. No, okay, I'm so glad you <laughs> no, said it. <laughs> Come on now, you know me a little bit. <laughs> I don't get tired talking about this stuff. Oh, cool. <laughs> but glad to hear. Interesting that you bring up the the virus because you also talked about how the that discordianism came became known as a type of cyber culture, but that this also then. I don't know if morphed would be the right word or how it developed that now this concept that we know of as hacking, that that also came from this. So viruses, hacking and all these things that, that this was also a, a, a part of the cyber culture because this was also yeah. a type of prank, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think it's important though to emphasize, um, instead of looking at discordianism as generating all these things, perhaps we can even look at it the other way around, which is cultural innovators were making use of discordianism. You know, okay. uh, we can talk about reception history and sort of looking yeah. okay. backwards and saying, oh, you had these really energetic, creative people looking for an idiom to express their ideas, and they found uh, fellow travelers, or what they considered to be tra fellow travelers, um, in these in this milieu of, of psychedelic psychedelicist militants. So anyways, I think the, the key case here is Hagbark Chalin, the, the German hacker mm -hmm. who, and, and this points to, to something really important, which was, you know, I tend to focus on North America, but this, the, the history remains to be written of psychedelicist militancy in France, psychedelicist militancy in Germany. And there is a history of psychedelic militancy in, in um, England called Albion rising, I think. But anyways, in Holland, it, it's an international thing. The interna internationalization of the hippies, that's a book that remains to be written. But um, in Germany, you had a, you know, first generation hacker who, yeah, long story short, um, adopted the name Hagbard Chalin, which was the protagonist of Illuminatus and perpetuated a number of so-called cyber crimes um, and was apprehended and uh, basically took the Discordian mythoscape public in his uh, in his trial, and, and really sh 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 a light was shined on what was uh, before that a very underground phenomenon, and then from there, whenever there was something related to cyber culture, um, the discordian connection wasn't far away. Uh, particularly if you think of uh, early publications devoted to cyber culture, uh, the most famous would be High Frontiers by Are You Serious? Are you <laughs> Great serious? name. You're yeah. Great name. Um, he was very much a Discordian and he considered himself very much a student of Robert Anton Wilson. Uh, if you think of Boing Boing, another first gen, very important cyber publication, uh, another person who considered themselves a student of Robert Anton Wilson and the Discordians and Tim Leary. And let's not forget that Tim Leary and Robert Anton Wilson themselves. So Tim Leary was Mr. LSD guru, but he didn't stay that way. Timothy Leary is a fascinating character because in the seventies, he totally migrated of all places to science fiction. Science fiction, what dominated the 1970s for militants. And Leary had his science fiction phase then. And in the 80s, Leary reinvented himself once again. I mean, Leary is quite a mercurial figure as computer guru. So uh, 
the Discordian thing, the Discordian movement itself was constantly being remade, right. reflecting the times. And in the 90s, it remade itself as the ethos for outlaws on the computer frontier. Again, we have this American thing once more reasserting itself mm -hmm. that the early internet was imagined to be a frontier, uh, which of course is a preoccupying trope amongst Americans for better or worse. Um, and, and, and what was the ethic? What was the uh, Bushido, Bushido, you know, what was the samurai code of these cyber outlaws? It was discordianism. That, that was the sophisticated you know, so internet sophisticates in the 1990s, underground sophisticates, you had a return to the culture that was presented in Illuminatus. You know, and, and it's, it's great. I think we've come full circle, yeah. Stephanie. On one hand, you have the know-nothing doofuses, Bill and Ted, <laughs> who represent a parody of the drug war stereotype. And then, of course, you have the real thing, which is someone like Hagbard Chalene, this hacker, or... Um, the creators of Boing Boing and, and, and the creators of uh, High Frontiers. Um, you, you had intellectuals who were steeped in what had that point become a tradition many decades old. You know, they, they look, people in the 1980s, hipsters in the 1980s, looked at Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, William Burroughs as founding fathers. They looked at Dinah DePrima as founding mother of what, a tradition of spirituality that they were still participating in. I have the honor of teaching Jack Kerouac now. I'm teaching a course currently at Yale called Holy Hipsters. Spiritual Heteroxy Man, in post, post war America. I join that class. Oh, it's a fun course. But <laughs> it's, it's, you know, I got my thing. I got my shtick. I got my act, so to speak, mm -hmm. when it comes to the Holy Hipsters. But I am so much more interested in what Gen Z thinks of on the road. Because for a long time, you know, before I taught this class, and I think that in a lot of ways, millennials thought Jack Kerouac was lame. Because he had been thoroughly recuperated. If you recall, there was a Gap advertisement featuring Kerouac. Like, it was just so commercial. Kerouac lost all of that authenticity. Yeah. It's heartbreaking, but it's true. Gen Z is so far detached from that that seeing these, if you want to call on the road scripture, which it is for many hipsters, uh, seeing it through their eyes is so fascinating because they're like, I've never heard of these people. So it's like, whoa, yeah. like, what do you? And a lot of times it wavers between this is interesting and new and problematic in certain respects, but also why does this all sound so familiar? Well, that's the refrain. Why does this all sound so familiar? It's because these books changed American culture. They changed the landscape of American culture. And so it's, 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 a, it's like when people read Aldous Huxley's Doors of Perception. That's looked at as the psychedelic book, the starting point. Yeah, you have young people go back and read it now. They're like, this is like really banal. It's because it was so influential. Everything yeah. after it adjusted itself to that. Right, right. Yeah. Yes. Very, very, really interesting. Fascinating stuff. So Discordianism, we're, we're now then in the 90s. Is this now considered a religion? Well, I think it always considered itself it was a religion. always a religion. Yeah, I think that, well, as I said before, if you recall, during the psychedelic heyday of the 60s, there was this belief that you could go beyond religion. Religion is what your parents did because they didn't have access to higher states of consciousness. So they had to amuse themselves with the smells and bells, so to speak, right, right. of established religions because they did not have access um, to, uh, to what, what uh, Tom Wolf called the Kairos. You did not have, have access to the sublime terror of the numinous mm. in the form of a sugar cube. So uh, why talk about religion when we have access? And I think that uh, something I also try to emphasize in my work is, you know, the psychedelic age, if we want to call the 60s a psychedelic age, was such a turning point by virtue of the fact that never in the course of human history did you have the democratization of gnosis. Now, we could look back to the ancient world and say, oh, right, in fact, we had the mystery the Eleusian mysteries and and that would be a iteration but now i'm talking about psychedelic alteration of consciousness mass produced shipped internationally overnight stamped <laughs> instant access i think that that had a profound effect on human development on modern modern human development but yeah to answer your question they always thought they were religion but they always thought they were more than a religion you know yeah, who I needs was, religion i was wondering if they if they didn't like that word 
religion. Sometimes it, it depends who was asking. I mean, this was something yeah. that you're going to see amongst hip culture. It, the, the term in the fifties was called capping the squares, but it's getting one over. I mean, what is hip culture? I define it as asymmetrical consciousness. Hipsters know something you don't. Mm. Uh, if you know the Bob Dylan song, a ballad of a thin man, there's something going on, <laughs> Mr. Jones, you know, but you just don't know what it is. That hip culture is that asymmetric and that asymmetry. I would, I would say is synonymous with gnosis. You know, what is it they know? They know they know. And so when someone asks, hey, are you guys a religion? Depending on who's asking, they might get one over on you. Yeah, we're a religion. No, we're not, you know. Mm. So to them, it's a fluid concept. Yeah. But for scholars now, you have talked about how this is now identified as a new religious movement, scholarly, you know, in scholarly terms here. But that this actually was a type of transformation because uh, I'm looking at my notes here, that, the, that this has created some problems with regards to quote unquote secondary aspects of the religion that's now considered, you know, well, this makes it a religion, which wasn't the basis of, of right, the thinking, right. correct? Well, yeah, so the religion... Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, this happens, of course, across religious movements now all the time, which is people in the movement read the literature on the movement and then conform their ideas to the literature on the movement. Uh, So it's a really interesting, I think it's called the pizza effect, which is pizza wasn't invented in Italy, but everyone said it was. (laughs) So in Italy, you had people claiming that pizza was invented there. (laughs) Right. Pizza effect. So, um, yeah, like General Gao's chicken invented in the United States. And then you go to China yeah. and there's like, welcome to the original, you know, we invent, okay. Yeah. Uh, and so that happened with Discordians. And I'll just give you one example. And that's the Principia Discordia, that book I was talking about. Mm-hmm. We opened this discussion with mm-hmm. that comment from that book. Um, scholars, um, how do I put this? Looking to make Discordianism available as an object of scrutiny, configured it so that it did resemble religion. And if you and I know anything, it's that religion is really just a, another way of saying Protestantism. You know, it's like <laughs> religion. I mean, this is this is no secret. If you read the if you read the literature on theory of religion, the idea is that many people think it should be disassembled because it is a modern invention to talk about religions that weren't Protestantism. So, is this religion? Okay. Well, what's the litmus test? Does it have a book? The Bible. Does it have a church? You know, it's mm-hmm, always mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, compared against. Protestantism. So when scholars wanted to make Discordianism available for consideration to other scholars of religion, a generous act, they did so by shaping it so that it looked like a religion. So Discordianism was presented as a religion. Principia Discordian was presented at it as its Bible. Well, that's certainly not how Discordians thought about it at the time. Certainly not how Discordians thought about it until scholars wrote about it. And then new Discordians read that and then absorbed that idea and it's no more true or untrue than anything else. If that's what they believe, that's what they believe. And so scholars have to take account of that. But I think it's important to note the mechanism by which that became the case. Yeah. So it's considered in academia, it's considered a new religious movement, but you cannot assume that the people that are associated with discordianism or, you know, adhere to the, to these uh, ideas that they would consider it a religion or a new new religious movement, correct? Particularly in the 70s and 80s. Today, you are going to find Discordians who are like, yeah, it's a new religious movement because okay. they've read uh, my work, they've read Kusev's work, they've read Eric yeah. Davis's work and David yeah. Chadester, and they call it one, so why not we call it one, you know? And is but, the term parody religion still contested as it had been in the in the past? Well, that's the academy, baby. Everything's contested, yeah. you know? <laughs> No, I mean by Discordians themselves. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. I mean, Discordians stick apart. You know, you get two yeah. Discordians, you got three opinions. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, I personally don't like the idea of parody religion because I think it's, um, of course, we always have to reify concepts to mm. make them legible. I don't think that's a particularly helpful one because um, it qualifies it. It qualifies it as a parody yeah. without acknowledging the fact that humor is just a valid Parody is just as valid as a language of the sacred as solemnity. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's an unnecessary and in fact, distracting conceptualization. I I, I would, I would just prefer to call it just a, 
just a religion. A religion. Mm-hmm. An invented religion, such as Carol Well, what religion ain't invented? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that, that was my problem with that, which is like, yeah, and this that, that idea was Carol Cusacks, who mm-hmm. does fantastic work. I, I, I'm such a deep admirer of, of everything. She, she, she's a very productive scholar. And yeah, I think definitely. Really, such a leading light here. And the work, she, she laid the groundwork for scholars like me to come along and to really elaborate more. Um, but, you know, uh, in the spirit of scholarly exchange, I, you know, in my book review of her invented religions, I said, well, you know, every religion's invented. So does this really, but let, let's keep in mind that that proposition, invented religion as a typology, was an essential part of the field in order to make this available for scholars to look at and to take serious. There is, it is impossible to underestimate the value of that term because it really did put it on the scholarly agenda. And, and that's yeah. something that I'd really encourage your scholars to recognize that, yeah. that we are here standing on the shoulders of those who came before us. So it's important to be generous here about Definitely. the ideas that we're using. Well, out of the invented uh, religions came hyper real religion, that's fiction right. based religion. That's right. So and these are all now luckily academic terms that are used now so that scholars can legitimately study quote unquote new religions exactly such and, and, as and really, jediism and tolkienism and and you know, spaghetti monster and, spaghetti and church monster, of all worlds yes. and, yeah, yeah and and really not luck but hard ass work i mean that's ass and chair time as i like to call it. these people had a serious <laughs> uh a, they really wanted to make this available and they worked their ass off and did it and and, and deserve all the praise yeah. that we can muster for them Really, yeah, and, 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 and the proliferation of these terms is nothing but a boon for scholars exactly. because the idea is that we get to talk, put it like this, making these available for discussion to other scholars is the point. that uh, This is how I approach scholarship. There are certain things I love to talk about, and I want to talk about that those things with other scholars. And whatever contrivances we need to invent to make that available, I want all of them <laughs> because it just expands the ring of people I can talk to about yeah. this stuff. I don't have to, it'd be boring if I agreed with them. So the fact that like let a thousand flowers bloom, you mm-hmm. know, and, mm-hmm. and disagreement if it's done in the right collegial spirit is actually the engine of the academy. Uh, you know, I think um, fellow feeling and, 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 and compassion and tenderness towards others, that, that's the whole point. And really, that's at the basis of my own pedagogy and, and research agenda is looking at material, being in conversation with other scholars and doing my best to take what they say and, and to see if I agree. And, and, and maybe I don't agree, but always in a spirit of generosity, because this is interesting and important and satisfying and amusing. And I want more people to do it. And I don't think it's going to happen if you're too aggressive or, you know, maybe, maybe lose sight of what's important at the end of the day. I totally agree with you on that point. And I think this is a a nice place for us to end our discussion about Discordianism. I think you so eloquently just closed the chapter. <laughs> I really do. You're too nice. <laughs> but there's one other thing that I did want to mention. Uh, you have a book that is in publication now. Yeah, it's it's going through. You know, you ever seen that? Uh, Modern Times with Charlie Chaplin, where Charlie Chaplin's like going through the gears and wheels of uh, the giant machine. Yeah, I have a publication going through the gears and wheels. Uh, It's Angel Headed Hipsters, um, Psychedelic psychedelic Militancy in 1980s North America. But let's not say any more about it. Let's, I'd really, yeah, let's, let's surprise. Let's leave something for, but that's just the title, Psychedelic Militancy, 1980s. So in the meantime, though, people can find your uh, articles on academia.edu. That's right. And that's uh, where I found a lot of uh, the stuff that I was reading about. That's about it. So, about uh, it. so yeah, that's a really nice resource that, uh, that other people, you know, non-scholars can also visit. I really enjoy that, that aspect oh, of it. Also, so. and this is embarrassing, self-incriminating. I, I put a lot of time in my Instagram. It's kind of silly to say, but it's like, I've actually That's met funny. friends through Instagram. And I think the key yeah. to that is keeping it small. The, the key to that is really finding like, honestly, like six to 10 other people and devoting your attention to what they post and then messaging them, talking to them on the phone and being like, wow, like this isn't super alienated. Cause I'm under the impression that either you're selling something on Instagram or being sold. Either you are 
being productive on there or you are the product <laughs> that's being sold by Mark Zuckerberg. So I'm pretty intentional about it. I try to be intentional about it. Well, thank you and, for, for reminding me about that. Yeah, they can find you there and your uh, your angel-headed hipster. Yeah, I think I'm angel-headed hipster's archive. Archive. I think uh, that's yeah, it. Yeah, my, my memory was giving out on me again. <laughs> it was drawing well, a come blank on. there We've been again. Really, <laughs> we've been rapping for two hours. I mean, this is a marathon. I mean, I don't even have caffeine in me. Well, but, uh, well, Stephanie, I, this is great. Thank I, you so much. Thank this, this you is so much. Thank you so much. And Especially considering my cancellation last time. We were supposed to have this the day after. Can you believe this audience? The day after I defended my PhD, Stephanie invited me to interview. And I was like, sure, that'd be a good idea. And then to say, I was still partying. <laughs> she was like, oh, are we going to meet? I was like, meet for what? What are you I was talking like, about? I'm feeling under the weather. There was like confetti <laughs> in the background. You know, Mambo number five was playing. There was a con- I was in a conga yeah, line. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, yeah, can we reschedule, please? Yeah, yeah. under the weather. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, but so I'm, you, I'm glad that uh, that it happened that way because we got to talk more about more things. So yes. uh, the first interview that I had in, in plan, in mind, it was a little bit more uh, restricted and, and shorter. So I'm really glad that we waited anyway. So it's not a problem whatsoever. But uh, I hope that the, that the listening audience uh, can... Yeah, can take something away from this. Uh, I yeah, think me this, too. <laughs> I think this is going to be a very uh, new uh, topic for many people. Uh, for me, it was something, of course, in the course of my studies that I would read about, but it was always kind of on a superficial level, and I never really got into it and you know, did a deep dive into it. So I was really happy to be able to do that myself, to read more about what this what this is all about. But oh, in yes. our conversation uh, just today, that. I've, you know, you've talked about so many new things that I didn't know anything about. So I'm, I'm feeling very enriched and enlightened. So oh, thank, thank you. you. And I'm glad we got that. to tie it into your research interest, which was uh, other kin and, yeah. and, and this field. It's always nice when there's a little bit of reciprocity between guest and host. And I should also mention, if anyone is interested to explore these mysteries further, I teach the summer course at the University of Amsterdam. So if anyone yeah. curious and, and willing to, uh, to go deeper into the mysteries, uh, the University of Amsterdam has this fantastic department, History of Hermetic Philosophy, Marco Passi, Walter, who you probably have had on this show, I imagine. Uh, Marco has been on Marco, the, yeah. Walter and in fact, not, I co-teach. Yeah. Oh, well, that's going to be a treat. But I co-teach <laughs> this, uh, it's called Visions of the Occult, and it's an intensive summer course. And if anyone's interested, let me invite you to check it out. It's a lot of fun. I just finished teaching the first maiden voyage and it was a blast so Got i welcome you all to good feedback about it too so yeah summer summer school yeah that's coming up uh, i'll be sure to put some information in the program notes about that so they know where to go to look for uh more info if they're interested so yeah i feel like i'm repeating myself but i'm just We're so good. grateful that you yeah, decided to to <laughs> to come here and talk to me about uh, about discordianism and 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 sacred laughter and the concept of humor and uh very very engaging and interesting material so thank, thank you. you stephanie thanks My thanks again to Christian for his generosity and the excellent discussion Please check out the program notes for more information about Christian's own work, plus all of the other fine scholars and authors he mentioned. You can find Christian on academia.edu and Instagram under Angel Headed Hipster Archive, and I will include those links too in the program notes. Be sure to also check out my social media pages for even more tidbits of information regarding Discordianism. And please feel free to leave feedback or ask questions there, should you have any. Next month's episode might be a bit later than usual, as I am presenting and chairing a panel at the Esogen Symposium on Esotericism, Gender, and Sexuality on April 16th. This online Zoom event is free to attend, but you have to register beforehand. So check out my Facebook page for more information if you are interested in this event. And as always, thanks for listening.